Okay, Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. Thanks for being here. Hope this video finds you well. Um, I thought of something last night. Now it's just reoccurring to me. Um, something to use the comments section for. Um, even if you don't specifically have a question. You know what? I'd like to hear from you on how your practice is going. What you're struggling with. What, uh, what it is that... Uh, you recently have found um, some energy from your practice uh, in solving a problem, in just general wellness, in uh, um, quelling your fears about something, just a state of practice kind of thing. Um, I'd love to hear discussions from you guys on um, how your practice is going. Um, just because I'd like to know more about you guys. And uh, it'll also, I guess, it would, it certainly would help me um, in searching out subjects within Buddhist scholarship that would uh, maybe be of some use or some building understanding of certain aspects of uh, our practice and uh, our doubts and our strengths and so on and so forth. You know, something that applies to today. Uh, this next go show, Propagation by the Wise, um, before I dive into it, I just want to clear up one thing about the word wisdom and wise. Um, and I think you'll hear in this discussion by uh, Nietzsche and this is a fairly brief go show, um, but um, the word wisdom we tend to shortcut everything in our modern world. And so when we hear wise or wisdom, we think brainy, smart. Um, and although there is a component of some uh, knowledge accumulation, some understanding of concepts, uh, that's certainly appropriate to wisdom. And certainly if you want to teach something, you have to have some grasp of what it is you speak about. Um, but in the context of Buddhism, wisdom often is about a greater awareness and understanding of your own surroundings. It's amazing really that uh, human beings can go through so much of life really not altogether aware of what's going on around us. I've heard a term in uh, the last decade uh, uh, about situational awareness. Think about that. Think about how many times you've caught yourself out, let alone somebody else catching you out. When you're in the throes of an activity or in a place or with others where uh, you suddenly realize how out of place you are or how you've taking a position and argument that uh, isn't relative to the actual conversation or arguing, argument that's going on. Because you're somehow blindsided by things that are quite obviously going on. This is our human nature. This is samsara. This is the nature of our attachment to self and uh, our intense focus on that. Me, 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 me. The monkeys. You know, um, to be truly aware, not only of yourself, which is a task in itself, which we challenge in Buddhism all the time, um, but to understand that the self is everything around it and extend that awareness to the situation, to the environment, to what's actually occurring around you. That's a whole nother level, right? And so when we talk about wisdom in Buddhism, we're not only talking about that, but we're talking about the greater situation of the actual time and capacity of our community, our culture, our country and our culture, and the globe, the world, our governments, See, because government, as Aristotle would say, starts with the self, expands to the family, 
expands to the neighborhood, expands to the community, expands to the state, and expands to the world. It's the same way we practice. But those are not individual things with walls of separation. They are all together in Buddhism happening at once. That understanding, that wisdom, uh, it's a little bit harder to integrate into your every act. So, wisdom, as you'll see here, um, a wise person is not somebody, is not only somebody who's quite um, uh, knowledgeable on a certain subject, but understands the application of that knowledge in lieu of the forces within its propagation. Is the culture ready to hear this? Is my family ready to hear this? Do I need to do preparatory steps? Is this the right time? So, here we go. Propagation by the wise. The correct teaching of the time can be propagated only by a person of wisdom. First sentence right out of the gate. Is this the right time to tell you you're about to fall off the cliff? Is this the right time to tell you that that's even a possibility? Are you able to understand what I'm about to share with you? Is this the right time? Is this the right time to share the actual physics of what you're doing? Or should I just let you boil the water so you can cook the rice? And we'll deal with that later. This is why Shakyamuni Buddha, after expounding all the sutras, entrusted the Hinayana sutras to Ananda, and the Mahayana Sutras to Manjushri concerning the heart of the Lotus Sutra. However, the Buddha refused to transfer to any of the voice hearers such as Ananda, in other words, the, his students of the day who were just listening intently to what um, Shakyamuni was saying, the sermons, or to bodhisattvas such as Manjushri, a bodhisattva being somebody who could lead people beyond just learning, but application, the Buddha instead summoned the bodhisattva's superior practices and entrusted it to him, a bodhisattva who would come in later days, later times. Because the general populace of the future would be more capable to understand what he was teaching now. The people of his day had a certain capacity and the people of the leaders of his day and the future leaders Manjushri could handle. But for the ultimate teaching, those people just, they didn't have the capacity yet so he entrusted that to bodhisattva superior practices, the bodhisattvas of the earth, those that would come from the earth, in other words, future generations, us. Even if a person of wisdom who embraces the correct teaching existed, how could he propagate it without lay believers who supported him? There's another way of saying exactly what I just said. The people for whom the capacity existed in their social structures, in their familial structures, in their po political, cultural structures, simply weren't ready, weren't developed to a point where the practices, the culminating practices of Buddhism made sense. So if you did, it doesn't make sense to you, why, why, why practice it? Why, why even endeavor to understand it? That's the point. Shakyamuni Buddha had the support of Brahma and Chakra, who were his patrons in heaven, 
From among the six paths, the Buddha chose the worlds of human and heavenly beings, and of these two, he chose to be born among human beings. Of all the places in the major world system inhabited by human beings, he appeared in the center, the five regions of India, and within the five regions, the kingdom of Magadha. The king of this land should have been a patron of the Buddha, but instead the country's ruler, King Ajachashatru, was an evil man. In other words, concerned with worldly delights and not concerned about the enlightenment of human beings. The most unfortunate destiny for a sage is to be born during the reign of an evil monarch. King Ajachashatru had murdered his father, a worthy ruler. Even worse, he had taken Devadatta as his mentor. Devadatta had committed three cardinal sins, the worst of which was injuring the Buddha and causing him to bleed. The unfilial and evil king joined forces with this blasphemous teacher, thus laying a double burden on the people not only for one or two years, but for several decades. This king repeatedly harassed the Buddha and killed countless numbers of his disciples. Killed them. This infuriated the heavenly deities and the skies re reacted violently. Moreover, the earthly deities were so provoked that great disasters occurred on earth. Month after month, violent gales raged and year after year famines and epidemics struck, killing the majority of the people. Furthermore, neighboring kingdoms attacked on all sides, driving Magadha to the brink of ruin. Then, motivated by a revelation in a dream, by the advice of Jivaka, and finally by his own inner doubts, King Ajachashatru left Devadatta and presented him before himself before the Buddha, to repent of his sinful deeds. Remember, he had boils broken out all over his body, too. So, we all take different motivations to finally come to truth and realization, right? As a result, his illness was cured immediately, the invasions ceased, and the entire country became peaceful. Not only that, he was also able to thwart the prophecy that he would die on the seventh day of the third month and in fact prolonged his life by 40 years. In gratitude, he assembled a thousand arhats to record all the Buddha's teachings. Interesting how transferring those sermons to text for future generations happened through this really kind of a not what you'd call an ideal transmission, right? But such is the zeal of a convert. Um, he made sure to get the most erudite people of his day to uh, commit Buddhist sermons to writing. Especially the Lotus Sutra for future generations. It is therefore owing to King Ajachashatru that we have the Lotus Sutra we embrace today. So that's a very interesting origin story, isn't it? Once again, proof that the Lotus Sutra existed in the Buddha's lifetime, not as some would say was an assemblage of uh, later um, sects and so forth. Um, they may have... Uh, started to observe the value of the Lotus Sutra. But as we know from wisdom, the people, the culture, the, the situation, the capacity of the human beings of the day were not ready for. And this isn't, let me say this another way. English can be troublesome as a language, as a communicator. Um, but we are ready now to learn and uh, utilize the wisdom and the ultimate teachings of the Lotus Sutra, not because we are so advanced, but because 
of the evolution of population centers, uh, population throughout the world, uh, our communications throughout the world, um, but also the great huge amount of avarice that we've collected. Uh, not that people weren't greedy in Shakyamuni's day, but they didn't have that much to be greedy about. So in consequence, their greed was something that wasn't nearly as developed as ours is today. See, this is why I want to open your mind to what it means to say the time, the, the capacity of the people. It, it may have been, and we've read through some things that have suggested that for people in Ananda's time, in Shakyamuni's time, uh, certain teachings were sat, were enough, I'll say, to lead some to their Buddhahood, their awakening. Yes, it happened. But the capacity of those people was sufficient and correct. Their situation was enabling of them to become awakened within the situation they found themselves in samsarically, culturally, the whole thing. It's not a matter that we're smarter than they were. It's a matter that their obstacles were far different. Their, their development of their attachments was far different. In sheer number, they were far different but certainly culturally and generationally and inculcated a word I use a lot throughout their ancestry. Things are far more inculcated now where a six-year-old has a cell phone than they were then when a six-year-old was learning how to work the farm, even if it was just little things. That was their knowledge base, very uh, very large to them, but very insular and and not multifarious, not, not many paths. So the focus, the nature of that human focus then is far different than when we say focus today. It's a huge thing to focus today because we have untold distractions which 3,000 years ago simply weren't even in the sphere of thinking. See, that's a capacity, a capacity for distraction. So in many ways, we're far more disadvantaged in our ability to focus, see? But at the same time, we're able to abstract things with less obstacles because we know so much more potential in things than a six-year-old in 500 BC, right? So keep in mind when we say capacity and the right time, the Lotus Sutra is the ultimate teaching, but it is the ultimate teaching for people who have hugely developed the monkey minds all the more reason why something needs to be succinct something anyone can pick up and do not a lot of variations just do this focus on this and it will help come three thousand years ago you could have a broader knowledge and attain your enlightenment but not everyone, not everyone could attain. But today, those, those earlier teachings, they just, we can't even entertain those teachings. They're only fundament upon which we can build our insights to, again, discover the value of Myoho Renge Kyo. That's it. But let us set aside the story of Ajatashatru. 
If I were to repeat the teachings given by the Buddha to King Ajatasatru, the Japanese would consider them to be merely my own fabrications. More discussion on the time and the nature of the culture in Nichiren's day. In comparison, but since you are my disciples and supporter, I will rele uh, reveal them to you. The Buddha states, quote, after my death in the latter day of the law, the land would be filled with those who pretend to be pious by observing the five ascetic practices, as Devadatta did. They will persuade an evil ruler to act against the one person of wisdom. They will curse or strike him, cause him to be exiled, and even make an attempt on his life. At that time, there will be ominous changes in the heavens and strange occurrences on earth, as well as violent winds, famines, pe epidemics greater than ever witnessed before, and these disasters will continue year after year. The land will be attacked by another country, quote, uh, end quote. This is the substance of the tenth volume of the Protection Sutra. The present age has developed exactly as the Buddha predicted it would, and Nichiren may be the person of wisdom whom the Buddha described. Though some people wish to help me, either their determination is weak, or though firmly resolved, they are unable to act on their intentions. Thus, you are one of the very few whose actions match their will. You will surpass others in your resolve, and it is because of your devoted support that I have been able to survive. This is Shijo Kingo he's talking to, in case you're wondering. The heavens are certainly aware of this. The earth surely knows about it, too. If any misfortune were to occur to you, it could only mean that, the hev that heaven wanted my life itself. Wherever one may be, whether in the mountains, on the seas, in the skies, or in the cities, one cannot escape death. Nevertheless, a sutra explains that even one's fixed karma can be changed. Tindai's commentary also states that one can prolong one's fixed span of life. Those statements have a lot of meaning to me, and just from my own life struggles, but... If that's something you guys want to know about, I think that's that's too much about me. I might talk about it if I urged, if it helps. But um, these videos are focused on Buddhist practice, not my whining. <laughs> Maybe someday I'll have a, uh, a biographer. Don't want to think of myself as that important. <laughs> just one of a billion people on the planet, right? And all of us can attain our awakening, no matter what our attachments, struggles, whatever. I just know that health-wise, I'll just say this, um, I'm going to be, what, 64 this year, September? Um... I'm quite convinced there's been too many things in my life where uh, such minute little things could have been the end. Uh, I'm really certain that it's my Buddhist practice that has kept me around. Uh, obviously, I'm not done. Uh, done teaching, done sharing uh, Buddhist scholarship. So, myoho renge kyo to that, right? Let me continue this now. I don't know why I went off on that tangent. As I've advised you before, until the Mongol forces actually attack this country, continue to conduct yourself in a circumspect manner. As for the reply to your Lord, declare to him firmly, quote, Since I am ill, it is most distressing to me to be transferred to a remote place. Moreover, the entire country is already in turmoil. Should an emergency arise, how could I possibly be a coward? At this moment, I am resolved to sacrifice my life for my Lord if anything grave happens. 
but should a sudden crisis occur, it is doubtful whether I could reach you in time from a distant province of Echigo. Therefore, even at the risk of losing my estate, I will not leave you this year. Anything else you command of me, I will obey without hesitation or fear. Even more important to me than this, however, are the, are the monk Nitrin and my deceased parents. It's quite a statement. Say in a ringing voice, be sure you are heard when you say this, quote, even if you disown me, and this is a samurai talking to his, his lord, his master, right? Even if you disown me, I will devote my life to you. My next life I have entrusted to the monk Nitrin. So obviously uh, Nitrin wrote this letter to Shijo Kingo because Shijo Kingo had sent him news that um, because he's ailing, he's an older samurai, one of the head samurais, though, has many underlings. And as you know from pre previous Go Show, he was uh, not always well liked because of his allegiance to Nichiren, right? Everybody around him was either Nembutsu or Zen, um, including his, his master. Uh, and so he incurred a lot of derision and uh, unrest and at times his master asked him if he was capable of leading his army of samurai because they, they uh, you know, they would talk behind his back and say things to, you know, so word would get to the masters and get rid of Shijo, you know, what is he? He thinks he's better than us, right? Well, <laughs> so as he's now getting older, his, uh, obviously his master was thinking, well, I'll kill two birds with one stone here. I'll, I'll uh, get rid of an aging samurai and uh, maybe boost the morale of a bunch of the under samurai that, uh, that don't like having him around. So Nitrin tells him to go to the, his boss and say, I'll do anything for you. And we have impending attacks coming from outside the country right now not a good idea to be gone uh, when I'm a, I'm still a leader, you know, I may not, I may be, you know, not well, but I'm not decrepit or dead. It would make sense for me to stay here with my wisdom and all my years of experience with you to ensure your safety when, when this is definitely going to happen. But also know that if I die in the process, that my life, my earthly life as a samurai is dedicated to you, no question, but I'm also dedicated to my, my filial responsibility of my, my deceased parents. So this is a bigger statement of who I am, Shijo Kingo, and a, ja a Japanese samurai. And my future moments, moments, and into death are dedicated mentally, spiritually to the Lotus Sutra, to Nichiren's teachings of the Lotus Sutra, to Myoho Renge Kyo. I will never be Nembutsu. I will never be Zen. I will never follow this lower path. I am focused on what is the correct and true path of my life my essence, my Buddhaness, which I instantiate in this life, not after death, not some faraway land. The land is here and now, and this is the depth of my respect for you and my position as head samurai. I can't do that from this place you're wanting to send me. Pretty pretty powerful statement. So he's really putting, Nietzsche's making him put his life on the line. Not that he hasn't done this before, but in this sense, he's, this is Nietzsche's also his clever way of saying to the Lord, to his master, the elite, 
You can play your little childish games with everyone else, but I know. I am practicing. I am, Shijo Kingo, am a Lotus Sutra Nichiren follower and subservient to you in this life. So it really puts the ruler on the spot, right? It means Shijo Kingo is making a huge statement because this comes with his decades of samurai and dedication to this landowner, this elite person. But it also puts the elite person on notice. I'm not going to be pulled into the, the fashion and little political machinations of these lower teachings. So it's, it's a call for him to rise to the occasion. And the, the, the worst thing that could happen is it forces a decision. It says, okay, you pack your shit and go to Ichigo. Don't want you around here anymore. Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche understands that Shijukigo is no worse off if that happens because he's already being told that he should make preparations to go. And in Nietzsche's estimation, with this dialogue about the wisdom of the time, He's spreading that teaching to Shijo Kingo, certainly, obviously, but by extension to his Lord. Albeit in a different form, he's putting, like I said, he's putting the, the, uh, the landowner, the elite, the, uh, the master of Shijo Kingo on the spot. Will you rise to the time? Because in truth, Shijo Kingo doesn't need to waste any more time with this guy and his dedication to this guy if he's not going to rise to the time. So, this is some pretty, pretty hard stuff to, to deal with. Uh, um, Got to admire the courage of all of these people involved. Strange times to be alive. So, that's it. That's that Go Show. Interesting little snippet into the lives of a samurai and a, and a monk, right? Namu myo renge kyo. Talk about it. Again, I'm really curious. How does this relate to you? How does this relate to things that have happened to you in your practice, in your life? Right? Let me know. Let, let our fellow... Sangha members know through the comments. Discuss this. I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for being here. I can't wait till the next one. I always feel, I don't know, more filled with life when I share these things with you. Thank you. Namu myo renge kyo. Bye bye.